And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you the story of a man who wanted to become important and the crime he committed to accomplish it. So now, starring Mr. Tony Barrett with Mr. William Conrad, here is tonight's suspense play, The Man Who Threw Acid. He was a young man serving his second year in the city assembly. And because he believed in honest government, he wanted to enact restraining legislation against the racketeers. At first, the older men, the wheels of the political machine, laughed at him, patted him on the back, gave him a cigar. They liked him because he reminded them of their lost ideals, wasted energies. And then they began to listen to him, wondering. The young assemblyman said in council, I wasn't elected to this office to see my wife and kids or, or anybody else's wife and kids dictated to by the, the racketeers and the hoodlums in this city. That's what's happening. Dope, gambling, mugging, uh, the protection racket started again. If the chief of police won't or can't do anything about it, I, I say we should. Make laws. Put teeth in them. Get rid of the big boys who run the rackets and we'll have a clean city. It wasn't a brilliant speech, not in content or in delivery, but it made its point. And the young assemblyman kept on making his point. The older, wiser city fathers began to take notice. So did the press. And so did the big boys, the racketeers. And the man who was considered the boss called a meeting. There was no red tape involved, no orders in triplicate, a simple direct edict from the top. And the organization was such that by 7 o'clock that evening, the hireling had been contacted. His name was Steve Kleiber, a thin, pasty-faced man of 42 who looked no more than 35. He lived on the fringes of gangster society, and like so many of his kind, was still considered a punk. He was desperately trying to gain a toehold before it was too late, because a middle-aged punk is the lowest form of underworld life, a lackey. The boss's contact explained the situation about the assemblyman. That's a snap, Steve. Just throw acid in his face and beat him? Yeah, that's him. 200? For doing nothing. You, uh, you get the acid for me? Sure, sure, Steve. You put the finger in? Ah, it'll be all set. There's nothing else to it? I told you. Uh, this assembly guy, he's, uh... Important. Ah, look, you, you want the job. It's none of your business, how come? Just you want to do it. Well, well I, I, I'm just thinking, if it, if it is kind of important and you want me, maybe you put in a word for me, huh? Uh, with the boss, maybe? Oh, now, Steve. The boss don't know anything about this. It's a private grudge. Oh. Okay, sure. You uh, going to pay me now? Half now. The other hundred when you've done it. Yeah. Okay. Kleiber was told to wait until he was contacted again. Then the asset would be delivered to him with further instructions. The hired man went home to his apartment and to his girl. He was happy. He had a big job. He had been accepted by the mob. Perhaps his luck had changed. He told his girl, 200 bucks, honey, this could be it. What I've been waiting for. Just a drop in a bucket to what I'll get in the next job. Oh, that's swell, Stevie. What have they got you doing? Uh, honey, you know better than ask. But I tell you this, it's big. Oh, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Some of the wise guys are going to be saying hello to Steve Kleiber before long. You going to take me out for Chinese dinner for celebration? Hey, sure I will. We'll have anything, anything you want. was a night for celebration because plans had been made to throw acid in a man's face. The boss celebrated and took his wife to a movie. The contact man celebrated, got drunk, and cried about his dead mother. And Steve Kleiber went to bed with indigestion following a too-rich dinner. 
The assemblyman sat up late into the night writing the draft of an anti-racketeer speech to be made at Rotary the next day. A week later, Clabber received a phone call. He was told to meet his contact in the park at 11 o'clock. He went to the designated place. Hi, Steve. You're on time. That's good. Gotta get ahead, boy. <laughs> you like being late. Uh, now, here's the stuff in this bag. Mm -hmm. oh, it's in a pint jar with a wide mouth. That way you won't have as much chance of missing. Oh, you better wear a glove, too. You don't want to get burned. There's a glove in the bag. Uh, uh, you right-handed? Mm -hmm. Lefty. Uh, so wear it on the left hand. It won't matter. When do I do it? 5, 5.30. Today? Yeah. Where? Now, you'll be coming out of the athletic club. He's got a 6 o'clock appointment. You'll leave the club about 5, 5.30. Eh, uh, how am I going to know him? Pictures, here. Yeah. Take a look at him. Yeah. Now, he looks like these pictures, so you won't have to worry. You can't miss him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I keep these? Yeah. What do I do after I throw this stuff? Ditch the bottle. Break it. And don't touch it without you wearing a glove, eh? No prints on them. Okay. Then what? Take off. Think I'll have a car to pick me up? Ah, uh, it's too risky. Cars can be traced. Someone sees the license. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have any trouble, though. It's a quiet street. Buildings near the... You know where it is, in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're right off the main drag. Just get lost in the crowd and don't run. By the time anyone figures out what happened, well, you ought to be home. Hey, Seems to me I'm taking some chance for a lousy 200. Give me back what I gave you. I got somebody else. No, wait, wait. No, wait, it's okay. But I sure hope you guys appreciate the risk I'm taking. We appreciate it. Oh, and Steve. Yeah. Nothing should go wrong. Like, uh, well, like, say you do get picked up. You don't talk. Huh? No names. Not even mine. <laughs> oh, nobody gets me to talk. That's nah, my boy. No. I'll be seeing you. You come around to the bar for your dough. When it's finished, I'll leave it there for you. He had six hours to kill before doing the job. Standing outside the entrance to the park, he was undecided. Six hours. And he moved casually to the bus stop and correctly, obediently took his place in line behind three other passengers as the bus pulled in. A very ordinary man carrying a paper sack in which was a jar of acid and a glove. He went to a favorite hangout, a bar at the east end of town, not because he needed a drink, he wasn't nervous, but rather because he hoped to run into some of the boys, or well, he wouldn't tell them anything, but he'd let them understand that he was onto something big. Hey, what do you say, Harry? Steve. And the boys been in, huh? Early. What's it gonna be? You want a beer? <laughs> Nothing like that. Something fancy. I'm celebrating, boy. Give me something fancy. Huh? What do you want? Oh, I don't know. Uh, something with bourbon, huh? Good bourbon. Soda, water. Mm -mm. Uh, uh, old fashioned, huh? Put everything in it. Make it old fashioned. Oh, uh, make one for yourself, Harry. And me. Too early. Come on, help me celebrate. I never celebrate till after five. Well, at five, I'm going to be tied up. I'm sorry. At five, I got an appointment. Big appointment. Uh-huh. How are you, Harry? Morning, Lou. How's everything? Oh, it couldn't be better. Fine. Hey, what do you say, Lou? Oh, Steve. <laughs> what have you been keeping yourself? Go huh? on. Hey, uh, how are you? Uh, break a quarter for me. i uh, got to make a phone call. Yeah, sure. Uh, how about joining me, Lou? Uh, Old-fashioned. Why not? That's a good drink. <laughs> Say, uh, Lou, you got any good tips? I Here's got a few... Here's change, Lou. Oh, thanks. Uh, Lou? What? I said anything good running a day. <laughs> Thought I'd put 50 across the board if you got... Go... Where'd you get 50 bucks, punk? <laughs> you know, it's it, funny the way you guys call me. That's really funny. Old-fashioned, 65 cents. Huh? Oh, sure. Sure. Thanks, Harry. Hope you can change your 20. It's the smallest I got. <laughs> yeah, Lou, that's what it is. And you guys call me punk. It's pretty funny. You got a little surprise coming to you, boy. Yeah? Well, I'll live. Uh, thanks, Harry. It's okay. Uh, forget the tip, Lou. I 
Just ought to do you a favor, give you a fin if the horse comes through. But from now on, I do my business uptown, direct. Right, you do that. <laughs> Never that guy, you hear him? Small time, and he's calling me... Oh, it's good old-fashioned, Harry. That's the best. <laughs> you sure know how to make them, all right? Uh-huh. The drink was too sweet. He didn't like it. But it was gulped down. He wanted to show them the bottle of acid. Tell them. That would make them know he wasn't a punk anymore. Instead, he pocketed his change and sauntered out. There was little better than five hours to kill. So he went to a movie. It was a triple feature, and when he came out blinking in the strong sunlight, the time was four o'clock. Holding the paper sack carefully, he took a bus uptown and noted that traffic was getting heavy. At 4.30, he walked past the athletic club and into a drugstore across the street. Sitting at the counter, he leafed through a detective magazine and drank two large Cokes. <laughs> The assemblyman had played handball, taken a shower, and by five o'clock was dressed and on his way out. His companion suggested a cocktail, but because of his appointment at six, he baked off. Wish I could, but it'll take me an hour to get out there. I'll take a rain check for next week. So long. Say hello to the wife and kid. Steve Kleiber was waiting outside the drugstore when the assemblyman emerged from the athletic club. He recognized the man immediately and crossed the street. By the time the assemblyman reached his car and was unlocking the door, Kleiber was behind him, the jar held firmly in his gloved hand. There was no one else in sight. Uh, hey, mister. Yes? Here's something for you. Steve Kleiber didn't see the assemblyman clawing at his face. He dashed the jar to the street and ran to the corner, and a moment was lost among the five o'clock homecoming crowds. He felt pride in the smoothness of his accomplishment. His nerve had held up. He proved himself as a man to be trusted. Any punk could do a good job with a gun, but he had performed a task few men could have done better. Cold, sure, perfect timing. He went home to his girl, and as he relived the moment in telling, he felt himself become flushed with excitement. So I, I figured it out, see? Just like a shotgun. You know how when you shoot a shotgun, the lead spreads out? So I figured the same with the acid. Get close enough, just close enough so it won't spread. I was three feet. <laughs> three feet. That's when I said, hey, mister. Then he turned around. Boy, he could have put me on the Olympics the way I took off. You should have seen me I'm go. I'm glad I didn't. Huh? Well, honey, I'm just telling you That's that... That's an awful thing doing a thing like that. I don't get you. It's a job, that's all. How come you didn't tell me that's what you were going to do? Why should I tell you? It's none of your business. I tell you now because I thought you'd be interested. I'm not. Well, that's a fine thing. I'm hungry. Let's go eat. No, no. I figure up a couple of days, lay low, just to be sure, you know. Now, look, you go on down to Delicatessen and get some stuff. Then lady can go down to Harry's and pick up a hundred bucks for me. He'll be there. <laughs> By 7 o'clock, the extras were on the street. By 10 that night, the entire city knew what had happened. And the man who had ordered it to happen, the boss, was at home smoking a cigar, reading. His wife came in and said... I just heard the news on the radio. Hmm? What news? Some man threw acid in somebody's face. He's a representative or a senator or something in the city. No kidding. Gee, that's terrible. Awful. Boy, I hope they get him. The man that did it. Yeah. And a phone call came into the boss on his private line. He listened for a long time. His cigar went out. He looked puzzled. You still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Oh. Well, it's like I said. He ain't dead, but it might be better if he was. The cops are really out tonight. Who did the job? Oh, some punk. Steve Kleiber? Does he know anything? No, I don't think so. I had a good boy give him the word. Then we're in the clear. Don't worry, in a couple of days it'll quiet down. But the boss was disturbed. 
His wife's reaction disturbed him. The phone call, what he had heard himself on the newscast disturbed him. The violent act had all the earmarks of a boomerang. Rather than instilling fear the purpose for which the deed was done, it had brought out swift and great anger. Kleiber was worried, too. His girl had gone to the bar and returned empty-handed. The second hundred-dollar installment of his payment was not there. His contact had not been seen that day. The next morning, a reward of $5,000 was posted for the apprehension of the man who threw acid. And by afternoon, the prize money had risen to $12,000. Kleiber read the newspapers that night and was frightened. Listen, honey, I'd better get out of here. Some of these rats get an idea to turn me in for that kind of dorm and trouble. Yeah, maybe you'd better. Now look, look, honey, you get out of Harry's again, huh? I need that hundred bucks. I'll have to have to get out of town for a while. Well, what's the use? He ain't gonna be there. They made you a sucker. After what I've done for him, you're crazy. A nice, clean job. Ah. It... Well, listen, I'm gonna hide out. I know a place. It's in town here. Till you get the dough for me, huh? How can I get it? Well, try, will you? Look, it's a flop house. I'll, I'll write you down the address. If I'm not there, I'll be in the Grand Theater. You know where it is. I know. Okay. If anybody asks you to see me, you say no. I left town, all right? Okay. Yeah. Hey, what about me? What do I do for money? Honey, I gave you ten bucks yesterday. Well, it might take a couple of days to get your hundred. But... Yeah. You're all right. Here. There's twenty. I can't give you more. All right. Now, look, you won't let me down, kid. You'll find him. You'll get me the door. What do you want me to do? Ride it in black? All right. All right. Thanks, honey. I'll, but I'll make it up to you. I'll bet. I see you. What a dirty little punk. At first, only a handful of people knew who had done the job. The boss, a half a dozen of his associates, the contact man, and Kleiber's girl. And then the bookmaker, Lou, remembered the incident with Kleiber and Harry's bar. Harry? Yeah. None of the same. Hang on a minute. Hey, uh, you seen Steve Clive around the last couple of days? No. I was just wondering. Oh. Remember the day he was in, uh, two, three days back, uh, the day the guy got a face full of acid? Remember him talking big, flashing a 20? Yeah. Oh, what do you think? I'll tell you, his girl's been in a few times looking for an envelope he's supposed to get. She's been asking for someone, if that means anything. Yeah. You, you know what the reward is? Last I heard, uh, 12000 20 It's a big stink. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in that guy's shoes. <laughs> if Steve did it. Oh, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. Oh, me either. The police had no leads. But they had an aroused city on their side. They weren't working alone. Every citizen was a potential ally, every news agency a powerful voice. The reward mounted, and a week it had reached $40,000. The money was offered by the city by indignant groups and individuals. Kleiber was no longer a punk. He was a dangerous animal, a big man. And he waited in dark places, waited for his girl to bring him $100 so that he could run further to get away. The police, the district attorney's office began asking questions, lots of questions. And they started with the boss. They weren't playing games now. Why do you keep after me? I don't know anything about it. Some nut probably who doesn't like a no smoking law or something. Why don't you guys lay off me? But they didn't lay off him. And he knew something had to be done, done quickly. He called his associates together. His city is not healthy with Kleiber running around loose. I get the feeling we better get to him before the cops do. He might know something. If he starts talking, we're all in trouble. Shouldn't be hard. Must be a dozen guys on the look for him right now. Forty thousand bucks ain't hey. I don't want him turned in. I want him killed. Yeah. Well, we'll get on it right away. It took three hours, and the word was out. To every petty racketeer, hoodlum, gunman, the word was fine Kleiber. If you turn him into the cops, we'll get you. Just find him and pass the word to the right man. You'll get paid off. The boss wanted him dead, not alive. Kleiber hadn't heard from his girl for two days. In desperation, he took a chance and telephoned Harry's bar, asked for the contact man. 
Harry said. That's you, Steve? Yeah, Harry. Yeah, it's me. Is he there? Where are you? Never mind. Is he there? Wait a minute. Hello? This is Steve. Listen, I want that money. I've got to have it. What are you trying to pull? Well, now, don't get excited, kid. We had a little trouble. I had to lay low. I'm sorry about it. Uh, where are you, Steve? I, I'll get it to you right away. Never mind where I am. You give it to... Your girl? Well, Steve, I would, except haven't you heard? She left town yesterday. She's gone off the coast. Now, Steve, why don't you tell me where you are and I'll get... He was afraid. More afraid than he'd ever been in his life. He'd read the papers, knew the whole city was after him. And now he knew from the sound of that voice... They were after him, too. There was nobody to trust now. His girl, everything gone. And even in his fear, he still didn't quite understand why it was happening. He'd done the job he'd been told to do, done it well. And they'd all double-crossed him. The big boys. He didn't understand. One thing he did know now, however, he was valuable. He was worth money. But was it his life that was valuable? Or perhaps they'd find him, kill him and then turn him in. The rewards didn't say anything about being alive. As he left the cigar store, he didn't see the proprietor pick up the telephone. Hello? This is Shackley on the corner of 5th. I thought you'd like to know Steve Kleiber was just in here, making a phone call. Yeah, he just went out, walking east. I'm in trouble. I'm in bad trouble. Punks, a lot of them double crust. I'm in trouble, I'm scared. Boy, I shouldn't be out like this. I gotta find some place to hide out. Where? Where? They'll get me, they'll be looking, they'll get me. And he felt safer walking because every place, any place that he might want to go as shelter was now a trap. He saw the police station at exactly the same moment he saw the black car around the corner. And a sixth sense told him what was about to happen. He started to run toward the police station. You cop! You give me protection! I'm the guy through the acid! presentation of The Man Who Threw Acid. Be sure to join us next Wednesday when we again bring you another presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Now, a public service message from CBS Radio. Remember that phrase, one of our aircraft is missing? Another time around, it might be, one of our cities is missing. Radar can spot enemy aircraft before they reach our cities, but there are gaps which only your eyes can fill. CBS Radio suggests, write or telephone your nearest civil defense center, or write to Ground Observer Corps, Air Force, Washington, D.C., to learn how you can serve in our Ground Observer Corps. Stay tuned now for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. You hear America's favorite shows on the CBS Radio Network.